Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is October 27, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 51. The autumn of 1929 was a time of restless anticipation. On all sides the air was stirring with the winds of change, radical change. In the United States the Prohibition era was in full swing. Countless thousands of illegal speakeasies sprouted up all over America. Millions of Americans, determined to enjoy the high times, filled the speakeasies. One dance craze after another swept the nation, and yet it was all just a little unreal. Now and then people wondered, where is all this leading? At the same time, Americans were increasingly worried about crime. Prohibition had brought with it a crime wave unprecedented in America. It was the era of the famous gangsters, the Capones, and the Dillingers. On one hand people were afraid, yet they were also fascinated, and gangster movies would soon be packing the theaters. It was also a time of turbulence on the international scene. In the Far East tensions over Manchuria were building among China, Russia, and Japan. Soon China would be fighting first with Russia, then with Japan. But even as these and other tensions were rising, disarmament was in the air. The great powers were discussing naval limitations, and there was talk of convening a great conference for general disarmament. Developments like these were setting the stage for war to come, but to most Americans they did not seem to matter much. It was more exciting to watch the multiplying exploits in aviation of that day. In 1927 Charles Lindbergh had flown the Atlantic in the first non-stop flight from New York to Paris. Later he and other aviators of this and other countries were outdoing themselves with new accomplishments. An era was beginning which would see flight spreading across continents, spanning oceans, and girdling the globe. It was a time of thrills with both tragedy and triumph. Aviation had caught the imagination of the public, and yet very few had enough imagination to foresee how aviation would soon revolutionize the world. But in that autumn of fifty years ago all eyes were turning to watch just one thing above all others. It was the New York stock market. For years the stock market had been booming upward. It had been so strong for so long that it seemed like a sure thing, but now for some reason the stock market was beginning to shudder slightly. Prices reached a peak in September 1929. Then they began to shiver and shudder erratically. Some stocks continued to climb, others dropped. Trading volume began to increase as more and more shares changed hands. Meanwhile the market as a whole began to drop. The market was suffering from chills and fever, shivering slowly downward. Then came Black Thursday, October 24. Stocks were sold off in an avalanche as panicky traders tried to beat each other to the punch in getting out. The tumult on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange grew so loud that worried crowds collected outside in Wall Street. By noon there were beginning to be news bulletins. Well-known speculators committed suicide. Meanwhile a visitor had arrived from England just at the right moment to stand in the galleries and watch the frenzy. His name? Winston Churchill. It was not until well into that evening that the ticker tape finally caught up with the chaos. All around the country investors and speculators waited and watched. For many, the numbers on the tape spelled ruin. As people began to recover from the shock, there were all kinds of official reassurances. The public was assured that the market and the economy still were sound and strong. It was said that there had been simply a shaking out of weak spots. The one thing no one told the public was the truth. The truth was that the worst was yet to come. It came five days later on Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929. As soon as the New York Stock Exchange opened, it was flooded with orders to sell. 
More than 16 million shares were sold, a record that stood for 40 years. In the process, the Dow Jones averages dropped nearly 12 percent in a single day. Near the close, there was a sudden rally because those who secretly had triggered the crash were snapping up bargains, but the day ended as the worst in history for the New York stock market. That terrible day, Black Tuesday, was not the end but only the beginning of the Wall Street disaster. It took nearly three more years until the summer of 1932 for the stock market crash to run its course. When it finally reached bottom, stock prices were down to 17 cents on the dollar, and the United States was in the depths of the Great Depression, a depression exported to the rest of the world. As America was dragged downward into depression, most Americans became preoccupied with the hard work of simply surviving. Concerns over Asian battles half a world away were eclipsed by concern over how to earn a loaf of bread. Arguments over disarmament were lost on multitudes who were standing in soup lines, and the stirrings of Nazi power in Germany seemed far less threatening than their real enemies, hunger and unemployment. The stage was being set for radical change in the United States Government and for war, and an economic disaster, the crash and depression, was an indispensable part of the plan. It prepared us to accept the changes wanted by the powerful, and at the same time it kept us so preoccupied that we could hardly raise our eyes and see what was coming. This month, October 1979, is the 50th anniversary of Black October 1929. Today we are assured that it is all different, that it just can't happen here again. And yet, once again, the autumn air is stirring with the winds of change. In the Far East, tensions and hostilities are breaking out as they did 50 years ago. Russia, China, and Japan are fencing and maneuvering with one another in complex ways on the way to a great new Asian axis. In Southeast Asia, Thailand is becoming more involved and a new Indochina war seemingly siding with China. American military equipment and advisors are pouring into Thailand as they did into Vietnam two decades ago. Meanwhile, Russia's client state, Vietnam, is putting pressure on Thailand through Cambodia. And in Northeast Asia, news from South Korea is suddenly in the headlines. Only yesterday, October 26, President Park was assassinated by the Korean CIA, which is a puppet of the American CIA. Fifty years ago, America was fascinated with the dawning of the Air Age. Today it is space that appeals to that same spirit of adventure. But unlike the situation then, America today is locked out of space by Russia. And so, while America's space program slowly runs down, the American appetite for space exploits is being satisfied by Hollywood instead of NASA. But through it all, it is the economy which is attracting more and more attention these days. In the autumn of 1929 it was the stock market which people were watching nervously. Everyone knew that speculation was rampant. The Federal Reserve Board had started tightening the screws, raising interest rates and cutting down credit. No one quite knew what to expect. Today it is not just the stock market but the dollar itself which is crashing. After the 1929 crash, the dollar was worth 200 cents. After this crash, the dollar will be worth 2 cents. In recent months, the price of gold has been climbing faster and faster as the 1929 stock market did just before the crash. Once again, the privately owned Federal Reserve System is tightening the screws. Once again, one of the targets is said to be speculation, not in stocks this time, 
but in gold and commodities. And once again America's investment community is developing a case of the jitters. The crash of 1929 was followed by economic depression, disarmament, and war. Today the dollar is crashing on the way to stagflation, that is, inflation and depression at the same time. Meanwhile, the issue of strategic nuclear disarmament by way of SALT II is on its way through Congress. And all the while, my friends, a secret war is already in progress. Up to now most of the battles have been hidden from the public, but in recent days there have been new developments. As a result, the secret war may soon surface in very spectacular ways. When that happens, most people still will not know the reasons for what they see, but the events themselves will make headlines the world over. My three special topics this month are Topic No. 1, the crash of the United States dollar. Topic No. 2, the Russian program to sell SALT II. And Topic No. 3, the surprise Bolshevik deployment of synthetic automatons. Topic No. 1, throughout the decade of the 1920s, stock prices in the United States were surging upward. It was the era of the great bull market. It was a time of prosperity for most Americans, with business booming right along with the stock market. Even the year of 1923 saw nothing worse than a pause in America's bull market. That was the year in which another economy, that of Germany, totally collapsed, as I described last month. Germany's economy disintegrated in a tornado of superinflation, wild speculation, and currency collapse. And the same people who brought about the German Depression then are bringing about the second Great American Depression today. After 1923, the Great American Bull Market went charging upward again. As in every market, there were occasional brief pauses and dips, but the overall trend was up and up. It became obvious that all one had to do to become rich was to buy into the Great Bull Market. More and more people did just that and the market surged ahead stronger and stronger. At the same time, the market became fertile ground for speculators who make their money from jumping in and out as prices bob up and down. Credit was plentiful, so there were fast fortunes to be made by buying and selling stocks on borrowed money, and it seemed as if a speculator could hardly lose because the market as a whole was heading ever upward. It became a process that fed upon itself. The higher the market, the easier the credit for still further stock purchases. Fueled by credit, the great bull market rocketed higher and higher, faster and faster. By the late 1920s, the stock market had become a towering giant resting upon a huge foundation of credit. To take away that credit would be to undo the market. To take it away suddenly would be to trigger a stock market crash, and this, my friends, was exactly what the privately owned Federal Reserve System did. Beginning early in 1928, the Federal Reserve Board began a process of tightening up on credit. It was a process which was little noticed by the public as a whole, but gradually it began to slow down the engines of business. At the same time, the Federal Reserve Board made occasional timid comments about speculation in the stock market, but for the moment they allowed the runaway market to keep climbing ever higher on its own momentum. Then came the summer of 1929. A few telltale statistics began to show up in the news showing that America's economy had begun to turn downward. Most people paid no attention or else they did not understand. But in the investment world there began to be frowns of uncertainty. At the same time, the Federal Reserve suddenly became more vocal about speculation. They made it clear they intended to crack down on the use of credit for that purpose, and as part of their supposed crackdown on speculation, 
they abruptly raised the discount rate by a full percentage point. Listen now to a pair of headlines. Discount rate raised one percentage point, and United States Money Plan called reaction to speculation. These headlines, my friends, might have come from the summer of 1929, but they did not. They appeared earlier this month on the 7th and 8th of October respectively in the Washington Post and the New York Times. This time the target is not merely the stock market as in 1929, but the dollar itself, as I detailed in my book The Conspiracy Against the Dollar six years ago. Rising interest rates and other more important measures are being used now to throttle credit. In 1929 the Federal Reserve pretended to be suddenly worried about the stock market speculation which they had fostered. Today the Federal Reserve is pretending to be attacking speculation in commodities and gold. In 1929 they pretended to be worried about the economy and then acted dumb as they destroyed it. Today they are saying they are worried about inflation and our weakening dollar, but now as then they are only pretending to be confused as they systematically make the situation worse. As the summer of 1929 faded into autumn, the stock market began to develop the jitters. The worst part of it was that no one was quite sure what to expect. To quote another pair of headlines, Wall Street is finding the Fed's policy more difficult to read, and speculators threatened buying bubble may burst. It sounds like the autumn of 1929, but again I am quoting headlines for this month, October 1979. They appeared respectively in the Washington Star of October 15 and the Washington Post of October 11. Of course, sometimes headlines are more dramatic than the articles, but listen to just a few quotes from the Star article about the Fed's policy this month. The article says that the new policy, quote, threw bond markets into chaos last week with prices dropping by record amounts, unquote. Another quote, a lot of the bond traders wish they had chosen another line of work this past week as red ink flowed through Wall Street. Bond prices dropped more on Tuesday than on any previous day, and estimates of total losses by underwriters ranged up to $100 million." Unquote. The article is peppered with phrases like, Fears the Fed would cause a new credit crunch. Municipals joined the slaughter. Corporate prices plummeted. The bottom fell out of the municipal market." Unquote. As for the Post article about the so-called buying bubble in commodities, consider the words, quote, "...prices could fall, or at least flatten out, and speculators could fail. Even banks are threatened, and some could go under," warns John Hyman, the controller of the currency who is in charge of bank regulation." Unquote. As the jitters grew worse in the early autumn of 1929, the great bull market lost its momentum. At last it was ripe for the kill. Federal Reserve actions had rendered it vulnerable. Now other manipulators who were part of the plan went into action. On certain days the manipulators suddenly dumped large amounts of stock into the market. Edgy speculators responded by dumping their stocks too to get out fast and cut their losses. The process would thereby feed on itself each time once it was started, but after each downward break in prices, the market would again settle down temporarily. Each time financial spokesmen would assure the public there was nothing to worry about. Each pause was only a breather before the next plunge, but no one told the people the truth. Instead, without fail, stocks were said to be a bargain because the market had become stable at last. Then the manipulators would trigger another plunge and it would all happen again. Today we tend to look back at Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929, as marking the onset of the great stock market crash. That is because we now have the benefit of hindsight. We now know that it turned out to be the worst single day of trading in New York Stock Exchange history, but the fact is 
that the stock market had begun its three-year-long crash nearly a month earlier. October had seen a number of increasingly bad days, but there had also been some days of recovery. Everyone now knows that the handwriting was on the wall, but at the time only a few people could bring themselves to see it. Most people wanted to believe that this was only a temporary break in the market and that it would soon head upward again. Most simply could not imagine that they were watching the beginning of America's greatest depression. But while the majority were blind, there were a small minority who were not. A select few knew that something fundamentally different was happening. Some of those who knew what to expect were the plotters themselves. The others who could tell what was coming were people who understood how the manipulators operated. Everyone else, that is, everyone who assumed normal market forces were at work, was lost. In AUDIO LETTER No. 19 nearly three years ago, I revealed very important information given me by my friend Mr. Norman Dodd. The information had to do with the major tax-exempt foundations in America. Twenty-five years ago he was Director of Research for the Reese Committee of Congress, which investigated the foundations, and he remains an expert on the subject to this day. But in 1929 Mr. Dodd was a banker at one of New York's most prestigious banks. In a New York speech in 1956 he described a remarkable development which he witnessed in early October 1929. He said, quote, I was impressed when Mr. Henry Morgenthau, Sr., a retired banker and former Ambassador, called on the bank in person and directed it to dispose of every security then held in his trusts and to reinvest the proceeds in bonds of the United States Government. Gratuitously, he added that he wished these trusts to remain so invested until he directed otherwise a step which he said he did not contemplate taking for at least 15 years." Unquote. Before that same month of October 1929 ended, the market crash took place. It ushered in the Great Depression which spanned a dozen years until America entered World War II. It also spawned the New Deal and big government here in America. In light of all this, Mr. Dodd says, Mr. Morgenthau's action, which contrasted so sharply with that of the bank, assumed great significance. To me it seemed he knew what he was doing and why. He did not appear to be following a hunch nor the advice of others. The impression he gave was one of confidence in his own judgment. It was this impression which convinced me there was a basis for that judgment that what he knew others could know." Unquote. A few weeks after Morgenthau took this action, Wall Street began to shake with violent tremors. Each tremor was worse than the one before. On Black Thursday, October 24, Brokers, traders, and bankers began to see the chasm of collapse opening at their feet. Speculators began taking their own lives. Then came a selling panic on Monday, October 28, followed by that blackest day of all, Black Tuesday. Stocks plummeted in trading so heavy it set a record, then rallied briefly at the end. A headline in the New York Times read, Stock trading sets record as market dives, then rallies. The article begins with the words, Panic Selling by many small investors swamped the New York Stock Exchange yesterday following two days of sharp drops in stock prices, unquote, and quote, buying by cash-rich pension funds and other large investors looking for bargains in the pandemonium brought prices up from the huge declines that they had seen during the course of the day, unquote. Another quote, the break was described by dealers as one of the worst in memory, and as one trader put it, I don't think we've reached bottom." Unquote. And quote, yesterday's uniqueness was evident from the moment brokers started arriving at their offices. Phones were ringing incessantly with investors wanting to sell stock. Top executives at some of the smaller brokerage firms found themselves pressed into service 
to handle the onslaught." Unquote. My friends, these words might have described Black Tuesday, 1929, but they actually are taken from the New York Times of October 11, 1979, this month. I am continually asked questions these days which boil down to two things, what should I do and when should I do it? But my friends, I cannot give you that kind of advice. No two persons live exactly the same way, and what might be right for one might be wrong or impossible for another. Instead, I am trying to put you into a position of being able to understand for yourself what is going on, like Henry Morgenthau, Sr., 50 years ago. Then it is up to you to exercise your own judgment in deciding what to do. For six years now, beginning with my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, I've been revealing information about the total plan to destroy the United States dollar. It is this that underlies all the other economic turbulence we are seeing today in America. When President Nixon closed the International Gold Window in August 1971, it rendered the dollar inconvertible. This led to an acceleration of the inflation throughout the industrialized world. The rise in prices of international commodities, including oil, led to a rise in gold prices. Meanwhile, confidence in the dollar has been slipping steadily. In the past, I have explained how all this could be stopped if the United States really had the gold claimed by the government. But the United States gold figures are a fraud. We are actually gold poor, and even the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, now a private corporation, cannot help when the dollar collapses along with the banks. So for years, my friends, the Federal Reserve Board and the United States Treasury have been deceiving the people with propaganda and gold charades. For months the Treasury has been scraping together scraps of junk gold to auction off as a bluff mainly to fool the public. But this month the Treasury announced that the regular auctions are over. Instead, there may be only erratic auctions on very short notice. The first of these is now scheduled for November 1, 1979, but Swiss gold dealers now believe that this change is only a first step toward phasing out the auctions completely. If this is so, this is exactly what I alerted my listeners to watch for in AUDIO LETTER No. 41. Meanwhile, my friends, it is now increasingly every country for itself monetarily. Only four days ago, on October 23, Britain removed currency controls on her citizens and granted the right of gold ownership. The next day the BBC reported that gold sales by Russia are now over. The day after that, Switzerland, which has supported the dollar for the past three years, announced a shift back to her traditional monetary policies designed to restrain inflation there. Increasingly, the United States is losing its anchors as the economic storm builds. As a nation, we have forfeited all our chances to prevent economic disaster. So now, my friends, it's only a matter of time. Topic No. 2. At this time last month the artificial crisis over Russian troops in Cuba was in the news. On all sides there was speculation about what the United States would do, but as it turned out it was all building up to an anticlimax. Last month I revealed the Russian strategy to defuse the crisis, and that plan has stayed right on track. The whole flap over Cuba began as a Bolshevik ploy here to stir up opposition to the SALT II Treaty. The struggle now over SALT II is part of a secret war in which the United States is the prime battleground. On one side in this secret war are the atheistic Bolsheviks, the former rulers of the Soviet Union. They have been overthrown, and as they are expelled from Russia, they are flocking here to the United States of America. On the other side in the secret war are those who overthrew the Bolsheviks in Russia. 
They are Russia's new rulers, the tough band of native Russian Christians who fought for 60 years to take over the Kremlin. Bolshevik power has been building fast in the United States for several years. They want to seize total control here and use America's military power to destroy Russia by plunging the world into nuclear war. To prevent that, the Russians are pushing their own levers of power here to move America toward disarmament. Salt II is to be only the beginning, but it is also a crucial test of power between the Russians and their Bolshevik enemies here in America. The recent flap over Russian troops in Cuba began as a Bolshevik maneuver, but last month I described how the Senator Church Robotoid strategy had enabled Russia to take the initiative away from the Bolsheviks. The organic Robotoid replacement for the late Senator Frank Church was programmed to act even more hawkish about Cuba than the Bolsheviks. In that way, the Church Robotoid became the one voice in the Senate that would count most. As everyone cooled off about Cuba, the Church Robotoid would be programmed to gradually act more satisfied, and in the process it would get SALT II moving ahead once again. But the key to the Russian plan was timing. An important ingredient in the Russian campaign to sell SALT II is their understanding of American psychology. Often we read or hear comments that those fellows in the Kremlin just do not understand how Americans think. But nothing, my friends, could be further from the truth. In Moscow, the Institute on the USA and Canada does nothing else but study our ways and our psychology. They have been at it for 20 years, and they do their job very well indeed. One of the most important facts about our American psychology was used expertly in defusing the Cuba Crisis. This is the fact that the American public as a whole has a short memory. Given a little time, we can be counted on to forget about anything, no matter what it is. To choose a vivid example of this, just ask yourself, when was the last time you thought about the Guyana tragedy of last November? Congressman Ryan, the slaughtered newsmen, and the hundreds of helpless men, women, and children murdered at Jonestown are as dead today as they were then, but today who thinks about it? Russia lost her secret missile base in Guyana, about which I had been warning publicly for over four years. A joint American-Israeli commando raid wiped it out, and the Bolsheviks got away with killing hundreds of Americans as a publicity stunt which was used to gain military access to Guyana. They got away with it because we, the American people, quickly lost interest in having our questions answered. And so in the recent Cuban non-crisis, the Russians knew exactly what to do. First they programmed the Senator Church Robotoid to grab the ball about Cuba. They made him make stern statements that those Russian troops would have to go, otherwise no SALT II treaty. Then the robotized Carter Administration spent a full month pretending not to know quite what to do. Gradually the Bolshevik-inspired fever over Cuba cooled off. Anything that could drag on that long could hardly be a real crisis, and besides, the World Series was just around the corner. The whole Cuba flap gradually began to get boring. Finally, the first evening of this month, Monday, October 1, Jimmy Carter Robotoid No. 17 grinned out at America on television. Our Robotoid President praised Russia for new assurances he had supposedly received quote, from the highest levels of the Soviet Government." Unquote. The so-called assurances amounted to a declaration that Russia was not about to change a thing in Cuba. Then Robotoid Carter announced, a few muscle-flexing exercises to make everyone feel good. A small new military unit would be set up in South Florida to watch the Caribbean more closely. We would step up surveillance of Cuba, 
and sometime soon some Marines would be sent to visit our naval base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. On Capitol Hill, reaction to the speech was feeble, with one exception. The exception was Robotoid Senator Frank Church. Before the speech, the Church Robotoid had been holding up the SALT II Treaty. Afterwards, he announced that he was sufficiently encouraged to allow consideration of SALT II to get underway in his Foreign Relations Committee, but to keep up appearances he pretended not to be completely satisfied yet. During the remainder of this month of October, SALT II has been gathering steam. In mid-October the process called marking up the treaty, that is, considering amendments and changes, got going. All along the Bolshevik plan has been to kill the treaty by adding amendments unsatisfactory to Russia, but already several killer amendments have been defeated in Committee. Robotoid Church, along with several other Robotoids on the Foreign Relations Committee, is doing his job. As programmed, he is so far succeeding in moving SALT II right along. Meanwhile the Cuban non-crisis is gradually fizzling out. Four days after Carter's speech on Cuba, an American SR-71 reconnaissance plane reportedly went sightseeing over Cuba, and on October 17, more than two weeks after the Carter Robotoid speech, the Marines finally showed up at Guantanamo Bay. Originally the mock amphibious assault was scheduled to take place as dawn was breaking, but since the whole thing was for domestic consumption here at home anyway, the time was changed to 8.30 a.m. By then the sun was up nice and bright. As explained in an Associated Press dispatch the previous day, quote, in addition to providing better light for TV cameras, officials said the change would keep Marines from getting hurt while boarding the boats in the dark." Unquote. And so it was, my friends, that on the television news that evening we got to watch the United States Marines scamper ashore at Guantanamo Bay. As of now the Bolsheviks are trying frantically to devise some new stratagem to upset SALT II, and as I will discuss in Topic No. 3, they may yet succeed in doing so. But at this moment the Russian campaign to sell SALT II is gathering momentum. Only two days ago, on October 25, the Russians dropped another important weight into the balance. The Senate Majority Leader, Robotoid Senator Robert Byrd, announced he will vote for SALT II. The late Senator Byrd himself, from my home state of West Virginia, visited Russia this past June. The organic Robotoid who returned in his place has been working ever since for the passage of SALT II. The Russian program to pass SALT II also includes much more than their robotoid maneuvers in Congress. The ratification of SALT II is becoming a thread which runs through the entire fabric of American defense and foreign policy. No matter where you stand, you will find arguments in the news today designed to appeal to you. The greatest single worry which most Americans have about SALT II is that it will weaken us militarily, and as I mentioned earlier, that is exactly its purpose. Russia's rulers want to do this in order to prevent nuclear war if possible, but the Guyana episode last year proved conclusively that most Americans prefer comfortable lies over the uncomfortable truth. Time is precious because the Bolsheviks here in the United States are working day and night to try to bring about war, nuclear war. And so, instead of trying to explain everything to a public that does not care about the truth, the Russians are telling us what we want to hear. They are convinced that the alternative would be the deaths of hundreds of millions in nuclear fireballs and given the choice, they believe human lives count more than words. As Brezhnev No. 2 of Russia said last June at the SALT II signing in Vienna, God will not forgive us if we fail." Unquote. So every possible argument is now being used to sell SALT II. We are being told SALT II will make us safer 
by making it harder for Russia to hide what it is doing militarily. Meanwhile, all kinds of new military toys are being publicized widely on the American side. The leader is the MX missile. If it is ever built, the MX will not be fully operational for 10 years, but its impact in making people feel stronger is here already. Likewise, there is talk of an ABM defensive missile to protect the MX installations and maneuverable missile warheads for our missiles to evade any future Russian ABMs. Another variation, though, is that we are too weak to do without SALT II. This theme is basically true thanks to Russia's secret space triad of weapons. As I've detailed in the past, these are the manned Cosmos Interceptor Killer satellites, the manned bases on the moon, and the manned electrogravitic platforms called Cosmospheres floating high over our heads and in other land and sea areas of the Earth. These super weapons were developed in secret by Russia and deployed suddenly during the closing months of 1977. The United States has no equivalent space triad and is at a great military disadvantage as a result. But most people today are living in the distant past scientifically, and so the fact that we are too weak to do without SALT II is explained in more understandable ways. For example, someone points out that America's highly publicized quick reaction force still exists only on paper. We do not have enough airlift or sea lift capabilities to actually make it work. No wonder it took the Marines 16 days to get to Guantanamo Bay after Robotoid Carter's speech. And then to make things worse, none other than Robotoid Henry Kissinger throws cold water on NATO. In a Brussels speech last month on September 1, Robotoid Kissinger said, quote, Our European allies should not keep asking us to multiply strategic assurances that we cannot possibly mean." Unquote. In this and other ways, the Russians are shaking Europe's confidence in the United States, and in the process they have set up what may be the most powerful selling point of all for SALT II, because now the ratification of SALT II is increasingly seen as a test of leadership for America. On one hand, Europe wants nothing to do with any more wars. On the other hand, the strange behavior of the secretly robotized Carter Administration is destroying confidence. NATO leaders are beginning to say, if Carter can't get a SALT II treaty, what good can he do? This move may be the cleverest maneuver yet by Russia. Should the Senate somehow fail to ratify SALT II, it could spell the end of the NATO alliance. War might then be inevitable. But America would stand alone. If SALT II is ratified, NATO may continue, but the desired disarming of America will also be underway. My friends, in the AUDIO LETTER for this past June 1979 I explained that the ratification of SALT II could well be the key issue that would decide between peace and war for America and Russia, and early this month on October 3, a headline in the Washington Star said, United States-Soviet relations back in holding pattern. The article itself said, quote, The whole relationship is hung up on whether the Senate ratifies the Strategic Arms Limitations Treaty, unquote. And an administration official was quoted as saying, It's an unstructured relationship because there's nothing but salt on the table, unquote. SALT II is of supreme importance to Russia's rulers. It will be only a beginning, but without that beginning nothing else can follow. Already pro-SALT members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee are talking about SALT III. On October 15, the robotoid replacement for the late Senator Jacob Javits of New York said, quote, 
We want reductions." Unquote. By the same token, my friends, the Bolsheviks want desperately to defeat SALT II and stop the process. They don't want reductions. They want war. Of all people, Russia's new rulers never forget that surprises are always possible in any human activity. They also know from long and bitter experience that the Bolsheviks have an uncanny talent for springing surprises. In fact, another of these surprises has just taken place, as I will discuss in Topic No. 3. And so by every possible means the Russians are working to dismantle America's ability to wage war. They already have crushing military superiority over the West, but where the Bolsheviks are involved, that is not enough. So long as the Bolsheviks are left with as much as a box of matches, there is always a chance that they will find a way to burn the house down. We sometimes forget that as of now there is no SALT treaty of any kind. SALT I expired over two years ago on October 3, 1977, but once SALT II is in force, it will provide Russia with an important new tool. It remains to be seen exactly how Russia will use SALT II, but the effect will be to begin putting handcuffs on the Bolshevik war planners here in America. Topic No. 3 Five months ago I reported that Russia had begun deploying an astonishing new intelligence weapon. These are the organic robotoids, artificial robot-like living creatures that simulate human beings. By introducing the robotoids, the Russians were able to make a shambles of the Bolshevik plans then in progress. Preparations were moving fast for a new Bolshevik revolution here in the United States, but the Russian robotoids stopped it cold. Even more importantly, the joint Bolshevik and Zionist Middle East war plan was thwarted, at least for the time being. This prevented the Bolsheviks from going ahead with the rest of their plan for an American nuclear first strike against Russia. Since that time, the Russians have been pressing forward with their robotoid takeover of the United States. Within weeks, the year-and-a-half SALT II stalemate vanished, and the treaty was signed in Vienna. And for months now, major surprises have been peppering the news which are the direct result of Russia's robotoid invasion. I alerted you to watch for these in AUDIO LETTER No. 46 and have commented on them as they have taken place. In Topic No. 2, I pointed out the continuation of the Senator Church robotoid strategy to undo the Cuba crisis and save SALT II, and this month there continue to be important new developments in Russia's robotoid takeover here. A very important case has to do with America's new relations with Red China. In 1978 the Carter Administration was in a state of panic over Russia's newly deployed Russian military power in space. The so-called China Card policy was the result. America suddenly dumped Taiwan and recognized Red China last December, but the Russians are working fast to unravel the ties between the United States and China. Russia is determined to reestablish her own working relationship with China. This month talks are continuing between Russian and Chinese officials in Moscow with this goal in view, and suddenly just this month a Federal District Judge has ruled that it is illegal for President Carter to breach the treaty with Taiwan. Instead, he says, Congress must be consulted. Only last June the same judge had refused to rule in the case, but since then Russia's robotoid takeover here has changed things, and so out of the blue has come the surprise thunderbolt of this ruling. It could hardly be better calculated to shake Chinese confidence in the United States. And it comes at the very moment when Red Chinese negotiators are staring across the table at their Russian counterparts in Moscow. 
In every possible way, the Russians are trying to make use of their robotoid advantage while they can, because there is a lesson which runs throughout military history, and the Russians know it well. That lesson is that when one side in a conflict develops a new weapon, the other side will soon counter it with a similar weapon, so a new weapon can decide a conflict only if it is used quickly. In AUDIO LETTERS 46 and 47, I reported that robotoid technology in the United States is far behind that of Russia, but now the Bolshevik and Zionist enemies of Russia have achieved their own surprise. The Rothschild interests, which control both movements, have for many years been deeply involved in biological research of all kinds. They have not succeeded in learning the secrets of the Russian robotoids, but they have achieved success with something similar. They are called synthetic automatons, or simply synthetics. A Rothschild synthetic is similar to a Russian robotoid in certain ways. Each is an artificial life form designed to simulate a human being, but synthetics also differ from robotoids in important ways. For one thing, they are generated by radically different techniques. Both utilize genetic samples from actual humans as their starting point, but beyond that everything is different. The Russian process is a close relative of recombinant DNA techniques involving bacteria. The details of the process are shrouded in great secrecy, but it enables robotoids to be generated from scratch very rapidly. The raw shield process, by contrast, does not start from scratch. Instead, certain tissues extracted from cattle are the starting point. The synthetic is then generated in a process that changes the genetic makeup in order to simulate a person being copied. It is the outgrowth of a discovery made 20 years ago in France. The experiment involved two species of ducks called khaki campbells and white pecans. The landmark duck experiment of 1959 was reported in a book titled The Biological Time Bomb by Gordon Rattray Taylor. It was published in 1968 by the New American Library, New York, New York. Taylor described the experiment in the words, quote, They had extracted DNA from the cells of the khaki Campbells and had injected it into the white Pekins, thinking that just possibly the offspring of the latter might show some character derived from khaki Campbells. To their astonishment, the actual ducks they injected began to change. Their white feathers darkened, and their necks began to take on the peculiar curve which is a mark of the khaki Campbell." Unquote. Beginning with that clue of two decades ago, the raw shield synthetic process has been developed in secret, and now, my friends, synthetics are beginning to appear on the scene. Earlier this month, on October 9, Carter Robotoid No. 18 was scheduled to hold a news conference. Three days earlier, Brezhnev No. 2 had made his proposals in East Berlin for military reductions in Europe. Robotoid 18 had been programmed to react positively to the proposals, but instead our alleged President said, quote, I think it's an effort designed to disarm the willingness or eagerness of our allies adequately to defend themselves." Unquote. The Russians were dumbfounded. This was a fresh robotoid. Surely the recurring instability problem could not be showing up this fast. After the news conference, he was bundled off for examination and testing, and that produced a second surprise. It was not Robotoid 18 at all, but a synthetic. The synthetic was then transported to Novosibirsk for further study. There, robotoid scientists were able to establish an important and unpleasant fact. The source of the genetic material used in generating the synthetic had been Robotoid 18, and whereas the Russian robotoids vary somewhat from one to another, the synthetic was virtually identical in appearance 
to the missing Robotoid 18, but an important favorable fact was also discovered. The synthetics are inferior mentally to the Robotoids. It is not yet clear how fast the Bolsheviks will be able to deploy their synthetics, but the guerrilla war between the Raw Shield synthetics and the Russian Robotoids is already beginning. The Carter synthetic on October 9 was a shock to the Russians, and yet they have known for months that the synthetics would soon appear. For that reason, the Russians are beginning to re-emphasize their other weapons in their battle against the Bolsheviks here in America. As of now, they are beginning to use geophysical warfare again as part of their overall campaign to whittle away at the danger of nuclear war. On October 16, Chairman Hua of China was in France trying to buy Mirage fighters, among other things, but the Russians sent a clear message to both France and China that they should forget the whole idea. That day a Russian geophysical warfare weapon was set off in an undersea trench in the Mediterranean off Nice, France. It produced a sudden ebb tide followed by a tidal wave that smashed 36 miles of the French Riviera. It was a new experience for the French, but not for Chairman Hua. The Russians used geophysical warfare to give him a message a year ago, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 38. But for us Americans it is now coming closer to home. In AUDIO LETTER No. 41 I reported the planting of 46 bombs underground for earthquake generation in California. During the past few months the Russians have been setting off preliminary quakes with gradually rising strength. On August 6, the strongest quake in 68 years, 5.9 on the Richter scale, shook San Francisco, and this month, on October 15, a Richter 6.4 quake was set off in Southern California. The Russians are becoming convinced that their robotoids will not be enough to stop the Bolsheviks. As I have reported in recent months, they have been slowed by troubles with the Robotoids, and now they are faced with the added problem of the Raw Shield Synthetics. And so, rather than let the Bolsheviks regroup and launch nuclear war, the Russians are turning once again to geophysical warfare, including weather warfare. The West Coast is a prime target because of the heavy concentrations of aerospace and military activity there. The Kremlin is debating whether the time has come after all to unleash the great man-made catastrophe on America's west coast. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you. floor of the New York Stock Exchange grew so loud that worried crowds collected outside in Wall Street. By noon there were beginning to be news bulletins. Well-known speculators committed suicide. Meanwhile a visitor had arrived from England just at the right moment to stand in the galleries and watch the frenzy. His name? Winston Churchill. It was not until well into that evening that the ticker tape finally caught up with the chaos. All around the country investors and speculators waited and watched. For many, the numbers on the tape spelled ruin. As people began to recover from the shock, there were all kinds of official reassurances. The public was assured that the market and the economy still were sound and strong. It was said that there had been simply a shaking out of weak spots. The one thing no one told the public was the truth. The truth was that the worst was yet to come. It came five days later on Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929. As soon as the New York Stock Exchange opened, it was flooded with orders to sell. More than 16 million shares were sold, a record that stood for 40 years. In the process, the Dow Jones averages dropped nearly 12% in a single day. Near the close, 
there was a sudden rally because those who secretly had triggered the crash were snapping up bargains, but the day ended as the worst in history for the New York stock market. That terrible day, Black Tuesday, was not the end but only the beginning of the Wall Street disaster. It took nearly three more years with one another in complex ways on the way to a great new Asian axis. In Southeast Asia, Thailand is becoming more involved in a new Indochina war, seemingly siding with China. American military equipment and advisors are pouring into Thailand as they did into Vietnam two decades ago. Meanwhile, Russia's client state, Vietnam, is putting pressure on Thailand through Cambodia. And in Northeast Asia, news from South Korea is suddenly in the headlines. Only yesterday, October 26, President Park was assassinated by the Korean CIA, which is a puppet of the American CIA. Fifty years ago, America was fascinated with the dawning of the Air Age. Today it is space that appeals to that same spirit of adventure, but unlike the situation then, America today is locked out of space by Russia, and so while America's space program slowly runs down, the American appetite for space exploits is being satisfied by Hollywood instead of NASA. But through it all, it is the economy which is attracting more and more attention these days. In the autumn of 1929, it was the stock market which people were watching nervously. Everyone knew that speculation was rampant. The Federal Reserve Board had started tightening the screws raising interest rates and cutting down credit. No one quite knew what to expect. Today... Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is October 27, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 51. The autumn of 1929 was a time of restless anticipation. On all sides the air was stirring with the winds of change, radical change. In the United States, the Prohibition era was in full swing. Countless thousands of illegal speakeasies sprouted up all over America. Millions of Americans determined to enjoy the high times filled the speakeasies. One dance craze after another swept the nation, and yet it was all just a little unreal. Now and then people wondered, where is all this leading? At the same time, Americans were increasingly worried about crime. Prohibition had brought with it a crime wave unprecedented in America. It was the era of the famous gangsters, the Capones and the Dillingers. On one hand, people were afraid, yet they were also fascinated, and gangster movies would soon be packing the theaters. It was also a time of turbulence on the international scene. In the Far East, tensions over Manchuria were building among China, Russia, and Japan. Soon China would be fighting first with Russia, then with Japan. But even as these and other tensions were rising, disarmament was in the air. The great powers were discussing naval limitations, and there was talk of convening a great conference for general disarmament. Developments like these were setting the stage for war to come years until the summer of 1932 for the stock market crash to run its course. When it finally reached bottom, stock prices were down to 17 cents on the dollar, and the United States was in the depths of the Great Depression, a depression exported to the rest of the world. As America was dragged downward into depression, most Americans became preoccupied with the hard work of simply surviving. Concerns over Asian battles half a world away were eclipsed by concern over how to earn a loaf of bread. Arguments over disarmament were lost on multitudes who were standing in soup lines, and the stirrings of Nazi power in Germany seemed far less threatening than the real enemies, hunger and unemployment. 
The stage was being set for radical change in the United States Government and for war, and an economic disaster, the Crash and Depression, was an indispensable part of the plan. It prepared us to accept the changes wanted by the powerful and at the same time it kept us so preoccupied that we could hardly raise our eyes and see what was coming. This month, October 1979, is the 50th anniversary of Black October 1929. Today we are assured that it is all different, that it just can't happen here again, and yet once again the autumn air is stirring with the winds of change. In the Far East tensions and hostilities are breaking out as they did 50 years ago. Russia, China, and Japan are fencing and maneuvering, but to most Americans they did not seem to matter much. It was more exciting to watch the multiplying exploits in aviation of that day. In 1927 Charles Lindbergh had flown the Atlantic in the first non-stop flight from New York to Paris. Later he and other aviators of this and other countries were outdoing themselves with new accomplishments. An era was beginning which would see flight spreading across continents, spanning oceans, and girdling the globe. It was a time of thrills with both tragedy and triumph. Aviation had caught the imagination of the public, and yet very few had enough imagination to foresee how aviation would soon revolutionize the world. But in that autumn of fifty years ago all eyes were turning to watch just one thing above all others. It was the New York stock market. For years the stock market had been booming upward. It had been so strong for so long that it seemed like a sure thing, but now for some reason the stock market was beginning to shudder slightly. Prices reached a peak in September 1929. Then they began to shiver and shudder erratically. Some stocks continued to climb, others dropped. Trading volume began to increase as more and more shares changed hands. Meanwhile the market as a whole began to drop. The market was suffering from chills and fever, shivering slowly downward. Then came Black Thursday, October 24. Stocks were sold off in an avalanche as panicky traders tried to beat each other to the punch in getting out. The tumult on the